my name's Tom Walker. I'm the chair of the Abney Park Trust. And I, my job is simply to introduce the video. As is obvious, it's the first time we've ever done this. Uh, so bear with us if we have teething problems. The first thing I wanted to say is thank you for registering tonight. When I looked, we had 105 people on screen and you were very kind enough to share where you are. I thought you'd all be just local, but it looks like we've got people from America uh, from across the country. So thank you very much. I'll just share a few brief remarks. So for people new to Abney Park or to the Trust, what do we do? We're a volunteer led charity. So Hackney Council run the park, look after the basic landscaping, but we're the guardians of its history uh, and its wildlife. What are the sorts of things we do? So in normal times, we put on events, we'd be doing this as an evening tour, perhaps that most of you in further afield wouldn't be able to join us. We provide information about all of the people buried in the cemetery and we do grave searches for people looking for relatives. We raise funds, we repair monuments and we seek to attract more and more people from our very diverse neighbourhood into the cemetery. There were three things I just wanted to share quickly. I've lived around here for 20 years. I think more than ever in this time of lockdown, the cemetery is offering a beautiful peaceful space for people to take quiet time and refuge. It's amazing. I've been going every morning with my two little kids. We put a recording of the Dawn Chorus up online and it really is a magnificent space in the heart of Hackney. The second thing is the stories of the cemetery, which we've been tweeting under the hashtag Abney180, are really incredibly evocative. You'll hear many of them tonight. My favourite place to go is the stand where Charles Dickens stood at one of the gravesides for a notable burial. And then we want to strengthen the trust, as I say, by bringing more members of the community into the park. We're a small charity with two part-time staff, and we're truly grateful for your interest and for those who've already con contributed to our fundraising campaign. You might know that the cemetery is gonna be 180 years old next week. This time next week, we'll do another event. Uh, and we are trying to raise 10,000 pounds ahead of that. We've got to 8,300 and if you want to make a donation for tonight's event or more generally to our work, please go on our website and link through. So in terms of tonight's proceedings, Romani, who herself is actually in California, is going to give us a very thought-provoking and thoughtful talk uh, on the cemetery history, its growth as a cemetery, as a garden cemetery, and she's an expert in all of these matters. I'll let her introduce herself. At the end of her talk, and she'll have some slides, we'll answer Q&A, so please do bombard us with questions in the uh, chat bar at the bottom and we'll do our best to work through those. And um, that's about it really. We've got to make some technological transitions. I'll plug next week's talk. I hope you come back. Please tell your friends and if we can raise that £10,000 by the 20th of May, that would be a beautiful thing for us to achieve. So Zach is going to press some buttons. We're going to switch to London to California and Romney is going to give you a brilliant talk for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Romney Reagan and I did my PhD research in Abney Park Cemetery. So that's where I'm coming from today with what I've worked on. Um, my PhD was actually from the creative side. So I looked at the layers of heritage that exist within the cemetery site as a heritage site and then stripped them out into what I saw as four different distinct types of heritage and made them into audio walk experiences that visitors could then go walk through the cemetery. And it was in a way to engage different maybe members of the community or activate some more creative public engagement to get people to see the space in maybe a new way. So today I'm just going to give you a bit of the research I did for my PhD thesis and um, hopefully some pretty pictures as well. So yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so there are quite a few Victorian garden cemeteries that are dotted throughout the UK, but there are seven that are located that are here in London. And this group of cemeteries are known affectionately as the Magnificent Seven. So in order, they are Kensal Green, West Norwood, Highgate Cemetery, our beloved Abney Park, Brompton, Nunhead, and Tower Hamlets. So these garden cemeteries were created as artistic creations. The architects who worked on these cemeteries, they worked with landscape and also stonework 
to create these beautiful havens of remembrance through mourning trees, shrubs, flowers, and masonry. And the Victorian era is famous for its perceived obsession with death and mourning. But I think we have this idea of it backwards. It's not so much that the Victorians were obsessed with death, it's actually we who are a bit phobic of the dead. The Victorian aesthetic was created with this idea of beauty within loss. And this drive to beautify the objects surrounding the loss of a loved one was done to help make mourning a bit more bearable. And it was during this era that we have to remember mourning was a very frequent part of everyday life. The development of this idea of beauty in death aesthetic has its roots in a few factors. The romantic period of painting and literature in the 18th century grew into the subgenre of Gothic literature and sublime painting of the 19th century. This aesthetic and art progressed into the real world in the form of a landscape and garden planning in the theme of an Arcadia. An Arcadian theme is basically means that which is ideally pastoral. It created a sense of the ideal within nature. 18th century landscape gardens brought into these created Arcadias a feeling of a nostalgic romance by way of mock ruins and classical feeling temples. These were created set pieces known as follies and they evoked the idea of something that was beautiful that's now been abandoned. One of the most preeminent examples of the Arcadian landscape are the 18th century grounds of Stourhead in Wiltshire. It's frequently used for movie shoots the most memorable recently being the passionate proposal scene between Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet. They stood in the mock temple in the rain for the last Pride and Prejudice film, the one with Keira Knightley. Stourhead was an iconic ideal of an Arcadian landscape and it inspired countless others. It was this bittersweet sense of loss that these romantic landscapes evoked, which was the inspiration to bring these garden ideas into burial practices. But this took a while. And I'll get that to that in a bit. To bring some context into why changing burial practices was necessary, it's important to understand what burial was like in the beginning of the 19th century. So the Industrial Revolution, as we know, brought about many changes into how people lived. One of the most impactful changes was the surge in people moving to urban areas. By 1850, the population of London had doubled from what it was at the beginning of the century, and sanitation and burial quickly became a problem. Small city churchyards were quickly filled to overflowing. Overcrowded churchyards led up to doubling up of grave use, resulting in shallow graves where corpses could be pushed to the surface by shifting earth. This then invited animal interference and contributed to abhorrent smells and contamination of local water. In this engraving here from a famous scene in Charles Dickens' Bleak House, Lady Dedlock searches for the grave of her dead fiance. She's horrified to discover that his body lies in such an overflowing putrid churchyard. Between the visible body parts and the horrible stenches, these graveyards were awful to even walk past, let alone envision burying your loved one there or spending any time by their graveside. So the idea to fix this situation was to create more burial space and to do so outside of London. In 1832, Parliament passed a bill encouraging the establishment of private cemeteries outside of urban centers. The cemetery company was born and over the subsequent decade, they founded the Magnificent Seven. The garden cemetery movement wasn't begun with this 1832 bill, however. As I mentioned earlier, those ideas have been developing since the previous century, and this burial revolution didn't happen overnight. It actually took about 50 years to become a reality. So the garden cemetery movement began actually in France, way back in 1784, with a man very ahead of his time, Bernardine de Saint-Pierre. However, pinpointing the originator of this aesthetic is a bit problematic. A very protracted process of idea sharing and mutual inspiration took place between Britain and France during this time. Going back to our romantic landscape gardens and their mock ruins and Greco-Roman Arcadia nostalgia, European visitors to Britain fell in love with this aesthetic. And you can even see in this garden here where the inspiration come, came for some of the cemetery chapels. These continental visitors to Britain, gar to British gardens, brought these uh, sorry, the, these continental visitors to British gardens brought these design ideas back home to their own manor homes. And it's a bit funny when you think about all these British mock ruins. They were aiming to add their own bit of history to their lands by alluding to the ruined abbeys and cathedrals that dot the landscape after Henry VIII's path of destruction, known as the Reformation. In European landscape, it didn't bear the scars of the Reformation, but now there's a nod to it with all these mock ruins that popped up as garden follies. But back to the point, 
It was in France that these British Arcadian garden ideas became the inspiration to bring these ideals into Morning Memorial. And for any cemetery fans out there, you know where I'm going with this. This led to the founding of the iconic Père Lachaise Cemetery, which just like London's eventual garden cemeteries, was also founded outside what was then outer Paris. Of course, we now regard Père Lachaise as an international treasure and landmark, but at the time, it wasn't such an easy sell as you might imagine. So, a very dense and unhelpful slide for you here. The government at the time wasn't quite convinced. St. Pierre submitted his proposals for Père Lachaise in 1784, but it took them 20 years to actually create Père Lachaise, which wasn't founded until 1804. And it wasn't until another 30 years after that that the Great Garden Cemeteries were founded in Britain, which was in 1833. And all of this, remember, was 50 years after European visitors first marveled the Arcadian gardens that inspired the whole thing to begin with. It was most likely an issue of proof of concept, and Père Lachaise certainly was that. It quickly became world famous, inspiring a wave of completely new ideas and burial across Europe and also the United States. Nothing short of a revolution occurred. What garden cemeteries offered that local Paris churchyards did not was a park-like atmosphere that could be a destination spot in its own right. A memorial in a garden would not only evoke memories of the departed within a comfortable and pleasing setting, but ideas of Arcadia as well. The most important aspect was that all references to the horrors of decay, bones, decomposition, and the dank, unwholesome graveyard were swept away. Graves in beautiful landscapes, surrounded by honeysuckle, willows, and creeping ivies, were places where the living could linger over picnics and remember their dead in a way that almost seemed to suggest their continuing presence. But even before overcrowding turned the local church graveyards into putrid places, there were other big ideological differences between these two spaces. One thing many people don't know is that graveyards and cemeteries are not the same thing. A graveyard or a parish churchyard are, as the name suggests, connected to a church. Cemeteries, on the other hand, are places of burial that are not connected to a church. And this is a huge difference when it comes to what these spaces mean for communities. The cemetery company that founded the Magnificent Seven was just that, a company, a secular entity. Some hints of Abney Park Cemetery's more fanciful secular designs can be seen in the Egyptian gates. And in Highgate Cemetery, you can see in the Egyptian Avenue these also these influences. So these garden cemeteries were designed to include funerary chapels. Some were separated into Anglican and dissenter chapels, some with only one chapel for everybody. Some of these chapels survive today, and some unfortunately do not. However, none of these chapels was ever used for worship. There were no church services held here. They were used as memorial chapels for receiving the coffin and sometimes holding a funeral. Neither the grounds of Abney Park nor the chapel are consecrated and the chapel itself was created to be non-denominational. Abney Park Cemetery is fortunate that our center chapel still stands today. It was burnt to a ruin in the 1970s, but with generous heritage lottery funding, the chapel is now stabilized to welcome visitors yet again for select events. Here's me leading a tour through the chapel, and as you can see, people are allowed to go inside now, as long as there's an event going on and there's a key holder present. The Trust has received a second round of HLF funding to bring the chapel to the next stage, from stabilization to renovation. There will even be public toilets, which I think is the most exciting development of all. For Victorian visitors to these garden cemeteries, they were a welcome refuge from the city center, and they were a place to enjoy the day out amongst the gardens. Garden cemeteries were designed with paths for walking, gardens for pretty views, and benches for visitors to stay for a time. They were created not to merely be looked at, but as a place to spend the day, and a family day out to have a stroll through the graves was not considered morbid, but merely a way to either show love for lost loved ones or just enjoy the rare plants that you'd see there. One interesting side note is visiting a cemetery was one of the few acceptable places that single ladies could go and chaperoned. A walk through the gardens could be a perfect place for furtive courting, offering possibilities for marriage. These parks were really places of life continuing amongst death. The unique design for Abney Park Cemetery was created by combining the efforts of architects John Hoskins with the famous horticulturist George Lodigees. Their goal was to create a space that combined graves and mourning with public open space. This included an exotic arboretum of trees and flowers with non-native species from around the world. And one important thing to remember is our beloved community park, Clissel Park, wasn't around at that time. 
Clissold wasn't founded until 50 years after Abney Park opened, not until 1889. So for most of the second half of the 19th century, Abney Park's 32 acres were the main public space for the community. Abney Park opened to the public in 1840. However, its long history as a wooded park predates its service as a cemetery by about 150 years or possibly more. The site chosen for the cemetery was previously the grounds of Fleetwood House and Abney House. These properties were built in the late 17th century. And here is a wonderful glimpse into what the house would have looked like behind the wrought iron gates off the Stoke Newington Church Street today. This image was made by Amir Doten, founder of History of Stokey, who also has an amazing blog and Twitter account. If you're interested in Stoke Newington history, his Twitter handle is at History of Stokey. So previous to being a cemetery, the land was the grounds of Abney House, and previous to that, the land was uncultivated woods and scrubland. As far back as documentation goes, the land of Abney Park has been a wooded park. For the first 20 years of Abney Park's opening, there was even a flowing river running through it. This is, this is a page from my documentation of practice book that accompanied my thesis. And it shows here the map where the Hackney Brook used to flow and also photos of the northern boundary of the cemetery. It's hard to envision now with how built up Stoke Newington is today, but the Hackney Brook River used to flow above ground and it made up the northern boundary of the cemetery, which is why then if you look at a map that's a little bit squiggly on the north, that's because it actually follows the brook line. Of course, it went the way of many of London's old rivers at the time, and it was covered over and turned into a sewer in 1860. But back when the land was the grounds of Abney House, the famous hymn writer Isaac Watts lived there, and Lady Abney was his patron. According to notes and records, Isaac Watts was inspired by the beautiful landscape of this residence to write his hymns. He would sit on the bank of the Hackney Brook to compose and watch the herons that nested on a little island in the river. If you walk to the northern boundary of the cemetery today, you can find a mound with a plaque dedicated to Isaac Watts. He might have sat on this exact spot to write. Visiting today, if you close your eyes to the brick wall that's there now, you can envision the Hackney Brook flowing there, right beneath your feet. And if you walk through Clissel Park, you've no doubt noticed the duck ponds. This is actually all that's left of the above ground Hackney Brook River. They're part of its river course. The Hackney Brook is still there today under our feet. It's just now flowing through the earth. So why was Stoke Newington chosen as the site for the fourth cemetery and the cemetery company's Magnificent Seven? As the population boom accelerated, Stoke Newington became a popular suburban neighborhood for wealthy city workers looking for a picturesque retreat for their families. And the area was lush and known for its rich soil. The design for the layout of the cemetery was worked on for a whole year before its official opening in 1840. Lodigy's planned an arboretum to conserve the existing woodland on site, while also working in an introduction of new imported species. Lodigy's planted about 2,500 varieties of trees and shrubs. He included pines, firs, flowering fruit trees, magnolias, and rhododendrons. He included both hardy trees and more exotic specimens, including acacia, box, dogwood, maple, wild olive, and quince. Lodigy's also created rosarium with 1,029 varieties of rose. I don't know about you, but I didn't even know there were over 1,000 varieties of rose at all. So when I learned that Abney Park once had so many of these lovely flowers in one place, it was quite a surprise. And also another thing you might not guess about Abney from its aspect today is that its collection was a nationally important treasure. It rivaled even the gardens at Kew. And it was in honor of this rosarium that architect John Hoskins designed the 10-point rose window that's in the chapel. Abney Park was originally laid out with clearly defined areas for walking and burial, but as the cemetery business began to decline in the 20th century, the woodland seeded itself, and now Abney Park is a nature reserve and one of London's most important sites for wildlife. Of all the lost aspects of the previous plan I wish I could have seen, one of my favorite has to be an ancient cedar of Lebanon that used to be on the site. On Stoke Newington Church Street entrance, the wrought iron gates we saw earlier that were used to mark the entrance to Abney House, just a short walk from there is where the cedar used to stand. And for those of you who are familiar with Highgate Cemetery, you'll remember that up until last year, the Circle of Lebanon featured a mighty specimen of cedar of Lebanon. This was the 300 year old tree before it met its fate in August, 2019. And it finally went the way of its buried neighbors and died and sadly had to be removed. I think we all remember that being a very sad day. Look, I love how the clouds are actually crying for the tree at this moment. It's actually a great shot. 
Um, but yeah, so Abney Park's cedar of Lebanon was the same species as Highgate's tree, and it was also the growth of many centuries. But one remarkable feature of Abney cedar was it had a mower's scythe embedded in its trunk, and it was sticking out the side of the tree for reasons unknown. If the tree had still survived today, this feature would have been a great addition to the cemetery landscape. The image this conjures of an ancient tree with a scythe embedded in it presents an allegory for the relationship between life and death, the grim reaper versus the tree of life. The cedar was not only visually unique, but also today would have been an interesting historical addition to the nature reserve. For Abney Park to be home to a tree that's twice as old as the cemetery itself, it would have been a reminder that the life of the land had before it became a cemetery. The aspects of the land that were shared with Abney House, the flowing Hackney Brook River, and the pensive rambles of Isaac Watts. The ancient tree began to fail and was removed in 1920. But there are many amazing veteran specimens in Abney Park, but I truly wish I could have seen this tree. In 1890, many of the original trees were sacrificed to make room for the increased space needed for burials. As Abney Park entered the 20th century, space decreased and new burials dwindled. The cemetery then entered a time of sharp decline in revenue. This, de this decreased revenue led to cutbacks on care, such as mowing and clipping, and the manicure garden aspect of the original planning began to give way to the real wilded aspect that we know and love today. The changes that Abney Park went through created what's called a secondary woodland which is a forest or woodland area that's regrown after a major disturbance, in this case, pruning and gardening, until a long enough period has passed so that the effects of the disturbance are no longer evident. Abney Park self-seeded during World War II and has continued to do so ever since. Tucked throughout this woodland landscape today, you can still find some of the veteran trees that lot of trees planted about 180 years ago. They're still there to be discovered. Next time you visit the park, why not take a veteran tree map with you and go on a hunt to find them? I think we're including a link to the PDF of the tree map in this video somewhere. Um, and also, of course, once we open, you can stop by the visitor center and pick one up and come say hi. There are about two dozen of these historic trees left, but my favorite of these original specimens that still survives today is actually a bush, this holly bush. This holly bush is 180 years old, and you probably could walk right past it, and maybe even have on many occasions, and not guess its age. Looking around the holly bush, well, obviously it's more of a tree, but <laughs> if you look around it, these time-worn graves to either side are far younger than the holly itself, and it's hard to reconcile its impressive age with these bright green leaves that you see. It's like the teenage vampire of Avon Park. Today in the park, the woodland is very overgrown, 90 percent 95% of the trees were not planted by human hand. But the timeline of how old the woodland is today is not so simple to untangle. There are still shoots sprouting from root systems that date to the 18th century trees planted during the era of Abney House and Fleetwood House. This creates a blurred concept of what is original growth. Even if the shoots themselves would be considered new growth, they're growing from an older original root system. This makes the ecosystem of Abney more complex to date than counting the rings on any one given tree. It truly is an interwoven world. The biodiversity and interdependence of Abney Park's various plant life and animal habitat ignites the imagination. I enjoy the imagery of dead bodies buried beneath thriving trees that become dead wood, then become a rich habitat for everything from rare fungi to tawny owls, all in this grand cycle. However, <laughs> this romantic utopian image I had of a full circle of life being present in the ecosystem of Abney this idea of a symbiotic relationship between human decomposition and the woodland canopy that surrounds visitors, this could not be further from reality. Only natural burial can benefit ecosystems in this way. And the Victorians were not eco. Victorian use, they used embalming, the Victorians used, oh my gosh, Victorians used embalming methods to process the corpse, which they then put into lead coffins, which were then housed in cement walled tombs. All of this was done to stave off the appearance of death and the intrusion of nature. It's ironic that all this effort to appear lifelike is exactly what prevents life's processes. So, because of all this, it is not advisable to go mushrooming, or indeed any foraging in Abney Park. Due to embalming fluid and lead leaching into the soil for 180 years, many specimens can contain arsenic. So, to feast on Abney is to join the dead of Abney. Control yourselves. 
The first burial in Amney Park took place on the 3rd of June, 1840, and it was that of the Reverend James Mather from Upper Clapton. He lies in a chest tomb just north of the chapel now. There are approximately 60,000 grave plots in Amney Park, with approximately 30,000 headstones that have survived time. There's just over 200,000 people buried in Amney. Abney Park entered a period of increased decline as it progressed through the 20th century. Revenue for upkeep came from burials, and as the cemetery became full, this much-needed revenue began to dwindle. The wide avenues of the original cemetery design were reduced to the winding paths as more burials and were needed to create it from them, and this was seeking that much-needed revenue. The problem with the Victorian ideal of in perpetuity is who is there to take care of the grave when all your loved ones die themselves? The purchase of a plot was a flat fee. The upkeep for these graves stretches into the centuries, which means these graves are left to a generation of people to whom you are no longer in living memory. Previous to the Victorian ideal of in perpetuity, the local parish churchyard would house your bones in the graveyard until it was time to move them to the charnel house. This would free up your grave space for a new body that was within living memory. This system worked well when populations were small and much like the perennial cleaning of the Louvre, by the time you reached the end of the graves, graveyard, you could just start back at the beginning again and use that same grave space. The idea of having a marker for you and only you forever was a purview of the wealthy who could afford to be buried inside the church. The rest of the population had the living, mem living memory rule to go by and an eventual end in the charnel house. The aspirational Victorian era offered an idea of a permanent memory in stone for the middle classes. It wasn't just the elite to the church crypt. Now almost anyone could afford it, could be remembered in, so, could be remembered in stone forever. The stone might be permanent, but the initial funds paid for its upkeep were not. This idea of an, in quotes, permanent burial, you have dwindling inventory with no more being created and with no more revenue coming in and living relatives dying off, you have expensive upkeep with no assistance. It's a business model kind of doomed to failure. And this was the common fate for all Victorian garden cemeteries as they progressed the 20th century. Over time, Abney Park's highly organized grandeur was transformed into a more unkept, wild, and disorganized space. As a, redu as a result of the decrease in burial and the increase in wildness, the use of the cemetery became more mixed. The primacy of its memorial function began to be overtaken by its use for secular recreation and hopes for nature conservation. So why do people visit cemeteries today? The motivations for visiting a cemetery are varied, and there are many reasons to visit a cemetery other than to pay respect for a dead loved one. And these garden cemeteries were designed with these uses in mind from the very beginning. In Victorian times, these cemeteries were created as leisure space, a location for strolling along the shaded paths and picnicking before the development of city parks allowed citizens to escape the noise and chaos of urban life. I mean, look at these guys, they've got sausages. Cemeteries provided the primary space available for enjoying the outdoors in an urban context. And that tradition continues today. Our cemeteries have not just recently evolved to be our local community parks, they were always meant to be so. However, that is not to say that cemeteries are exactly the same as a local park. Even if visitors have come to just walk the dog, there's a reason why they came to the cemetery to walk the dog. These spaces are special and they're different and that these burial sites not only offer contact with nature, but they also provide places to contemplate our mortality, confront symbols of death in a pleasing way. So the question comes to this, can we create cemetery space that welcomes the community while also respecting a heritage of mourning? I believe the conversation can move forward in a constructive way when we realize the motivations for community use and memorial use are not mutually exclusive. It would be inappropriate to treat any cemetery as exclusively a community park and exclude entirely its status as a cemetery space of mourning and memorial. I think it's important for events teams to communicate effectively with the community that their cemetery events calendars are not a negation of memorial. That's not the goal. It's rather that mixed use works alongside the memorial aspect of the cemetery. The debate is not between for memorial or against memorial event space and memorial space can coexist respectfully. Using cemeteries as this kind of social space raises a few questions, however. What are the guidelines for appropriate behavior? How should tourists and visitors behave in the company of mourners? And who decides what constitutes respect for the living and also the dead? 
And it can become quite a heated discussion with any space that deals with death, as there's a fine line between celebration and joy and then flat out irreverence. And these issues of who creates the guidelines of appropriate behavior is a debate that many people working with any kind of community space I'm sure will be familiar with. While the cemetery can be seen as a community space by most visitors and even by some mourners, the lines of appropriate use are divided by some quite subjective concepts of what's considered respectful, creating an atmosphere of solemnity or of celebration of life. Over time, shifting cultural attitudes have formed what are considered the acceptable and unacceptable activities within cemetery space. Community use of cemeteries has evolved over many centuries and it's not remained a static relationship. There's no such thing as this is the way it's always been done because this is, all, this is constantly changing. Some members of the community will feel that celebrating life amongst death is how they wanna honor their loved ones. Some other members will feel that a solemn memorial is best. And this is the tension between celebration and solemnity in the cemetery space, and neither perspective is wrong. One thing that's unavoidable is that our contemporary attitudes toward death and dying are changing. Our current cultural desire for a secular mortality mediation space means that mixed use of cemeteries as community space are likely to become more commonplace, not less so. And as cemeteries today embrace a variety of perspectives and voices within their walls, and mixed use brings a sense of community relevance to what's arguably a dying mode of body disposal and grief, the transformation of the perceptions of cemeteries from morbid and solemn to celebratory and inclusive will evolve as society's sensibilities towards death evolve and cemeteries will undergo a cultural perception shift once again. There's also a really kind of nuts and bolts reality to consider here, the expensive upkeep of cemetery space and most cemeteries receive no outside funding they're largely run by volunteers who help the underpaid staff, and they have to raise money themselves. Even heritage lottery funding, as was given to Abney Park to stabilize the chapel, is strictly earmarked for renovation purposes and was given to Hackney Council, not the Abney Park Trust. Events bring in much needed revenue to keep the gates open and the cemetery free for everyone. Events also keep interest in cemetery heritage alive. If a heritage site doesn't invite engagement with younger generations, or address the increased diversity within our neighborhoods, then heritage cemeteries will cease to be relevant for their communities. One very large issue facing many heritage sites today, not, not only cemeteries, is this idea of continuing community relevance. The audiences for our heritage sites are aging out. As frequent surveys reveal, the age brackets and racial demographics for heritage visits are largely illustrating an older white audience. So what does that mean for a heritage site wishing to be a living community space for today and tomorrow? For our contemporary communities, which are a collection of diversity, people of color, LGBTQ, non-Western perspectives and younger globalized identities. I love history and I don't, want to, I don't want to write over it. I don't believe that by including more voices in our heritage stories, we have to silence any existing perspectives. We should listen to each other and move forward with respect, but we must move forward. It's by the action of all heritage sites, cemeteries included, opening their gates to events and celebrating continuing change in life that we're ensuring their community relevance for future generations. There isn't scope within this talk to delve into the seismic changing attitudes towards end of life care, evolving green burial initiatives or the death positive movement, but these are also hugely transformative forces as well. It's a matter of evolve or perish. Even cemeteries can die. So with that super dramatic ending, um, I just wanna thank you so much for joining me in this presentation today. Don't forget to come and say hi to us when the visitor center is open again. And also please use the donate button link if you're moved to help Abney Park today. There is lots more information to share about the history of Abney Park and also Stoke Newington. You can pick up a veteran tree map or download it now on your computer. You can walk around the park with that on your own. You can also, when we're open, pick up Russell Miller's in-depth book, The Trees and Woodland of Abney Park, which shares more about its ecological history. There's also work by local artists and information about our events. And if you can't wait until we open and you wanna to go to Abney right this minute, then my audio walks are also available on Abney Park's website, also on my SoundCloud page, if you want audio walks around other places in London. They're free to stream and take anytime you'd like. And if you're interested in the weird and wonderful tales of folklore throughout the British Isles, I also post new stories every week on my blog, Blackthorn and Stone. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what should I do now, Zach? 
Yeah, let's go to Q&A. Do you want me to get off screen sharing? Oops. Uh, technology. Stop. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we. Oh. Okay. Well, hello. Hi. <laughs> Oh, oh, am I going to read them? I thought you were going to read them. Oh, no, that's okay. I didn't realize it was. Let me just move because my face is in the middle of them. Where did they go? Oh, here we are. Um, oh, do other, so Stacy Hackner asked, do other European countries have garden cemeteries as well? And absolutely. Um, this was an international movement. Perlis has sparked something that was an international conversation that many people wanted to take part in. And they are throughout Europe. The only reason why I focus on the UK is because that was the site of my PhD research. But someone could literally do, and in fact, if you want, um, there's a marvelous book by um, Stevens Curl. It's the Victorian Celebration of Death. And it really goes into um, sort of a wider variety of garden cemeteries. Once again, from a UK focus, but there's um, there's a lot to be learned out there about garden cemeteries as a whole. They, they were European wide and also across the US as well. Um, we have uh, Melanie asked, mm, was the idea of picnicking in a cemetery originally a shocking one? Um, no, um, that, that's, that's sort of the thing that's been interesting about the conversation within, within events about, um, a lot of people have an idea about what is appropriate use of a cemetery space. And one of the sort of uh, little bits of like soapboxing that I do is trying to explain that this was a, a very um, normal expected thing to do. And also um, even, even continuing today, when you think of uh, Mexican heritage, um, they have, uh, the idea of feasting with, with your dead loved ones on Dia dos Muertos and the idea of taking a picnic and breaking bread with your dead loved one was very much considered respectful and not disrespectful. I think that it probably was with the Victorian Garden Cemeteries that you would take these picnics not to a specific loved one's grave. Like you wouldn't necessarily go there to honor them. You could also just go with your family. Um, they were designed as parks. So yes, it wasn't shocking. Um, from Joe DeGlass asked, um, how, how is the desire to rid our society of the putrid sight and smell of death affected our capacity to understand and accept our immortality. Um, yes, this is a huge conversation um, that we all have within the death community about. Um, this idea of separation, um, the idea of sequestering death and dying persons away from your own personal, this, uh, your ring of perception, that it's basically, even if you have death in your life, and even if you have a lot of death in your life, you don't have an embodied experience of that death. So. You, if a loved one dies, you don't, first of all, you don't take care of them in their last, last end, the end of care is taken care of in the hospice, but you also would not wash the body and prepare them in your front parlor. You would not be taking care of that embodied real, the sort of labor of grief you wouldn't be doing today. And so even though you might say, oh yes, on the news, we have, we have, you know, knife crime, we've got school shootings, we've got obviously now COVID-19. It's still not embodied. In fact, if any way, if, if anything, we're even more separated from these processes than we ever have been. And it's so it's not a frequency of death. It's your ring of intimacy with the labor of grief that makes for a denial. Um, I think that answered that. Um, VB asks two part question. Um, where was the Rose Garden and are there any magnolias left in Abney Park? This actually, I, I cannot answer that. I don't know. Um, hopefully we can, Zach, we're going to have follow-ups, right? If I don't know an answer, are we going to post? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, never mind. They're, they're not me. Um, yeah, so unfortunately I don't know. Um, and I, I'm going to say off the cuff, I don't believe there are any magnolias, I, but I don't take my word on that. I'm, that's just an impression. It's not fact. So we will get back to you with a real answer to that question. Um, is my... PhD published online. Yes, it is actually. I'm very happy. It took them a while. Um, at the British Library. It's um, it's called um, it's called Abney Rambles, um, an audio walking practice in the Victorian Garden Cemetery. And you can get that through um, the British Library. They finally uploaded it. So yes, it's um, it's not published as such. Um, it's not like a book. I didn't want to go that, that route with it. But um, yes, you can read it online. And also anyone, anyone who wants to email me any questions about this kind of stuff, I'm happy to share chapters. I'll share my bibliography, all my resources of which, of course, I'm not listing here. Um, not a problem. Um, uh, another question. How do you see the National Memorial Arboretum within the framework of garden cemeteries? Um, 
I don't know what, I mean, I have to say, I don't know what that is. Um, I'm embarrassed to say. Can someone help me out? What, what does anyone, do either you two, Zach, do you know what the National Memorial Arboretum is? Um, I'm afraid I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, that's, that's outside of my particular scope of research, so I apologize. Um, I can say that Arboretums in general are definitely, um, were a core part of all the garden cemeteries, not just Abney. Um, Abney's was uniquely diverse in the sense there were so many exotic specimens. And I do believe, um, while, while everyone would sort of study, like there, there was the, the Luden, you know, handbook for creating a, a, a perfect memorial landscape with, you know, the yew trees and they had different, um, the symbolism. And so it was mostly a Luden landscape. We had the benefit of Lodges in Abney Park, which made that all the more exotic, um, but not other cemeteries weren't quite as exotic as Abney, um, but they were still arboretums. Um, um, Scott Heather asked, um, thank you so much, you're welcome. Um, can you talk more about the architecture of the chapel and the influence um, from the landscape? You mentioned the rose window. Yeah, so um, what's interesting about the chapel is that it was a real hodgepodge and it was it was quite it was quite vilified at the time because the idea is it's a non-denominational cemetery and the area of Stoke Newington was to center. There was a, a drive to have the cemetery serve its community and to that end, Abney Park was very much a hotbed of dissent or thought. So that's one of the reasons why Abney Park, the grounds are not consecrated. And it's one of the reasons why John Hoskins wanted to illustrate that in the chapel with there's there's a real mashup of styles that people who are familiar with um, architecture, architecture theory say is awful, which is kind of funny. I think it's fantastic. I'm sure we all agree it's fantastic. But at the time, it wasn't considered so. Um, it has just too many different architectural designs crashed into one chapel. Um, and so, yeah, they... they they didn't like it back then, but we love it now. Um, when was the chapel last used for a burial? Ooh, ooh, that's good. Um, well, I know it definitely wasn't in the 70s. That's when it burned. Um, so, okay, the one thing I do know about the burial timeline is that, so the last plots for burial were sold in 1974, but that doesn't mean that burial isn't happening today if people already hold plots. So it makes it a bit complicated to knowing, like, how much empty space, because a lot of times people say, oh, you know how much space is left and there really isn't a good way to get that to get that number of what that space would be um so people can come today with um with a burial plot and, and be buried but you can't um sell it so i don't have the answer for that but i would assume the 70s is when is when avenue park was abandoned by the cemetery company officially so i'm assuming in the 60s once again this is just going off of other my inference from the timeline i do know so hopefully um once again hopefully somebody will if, if Zach or, or Tom want to like, look into the exact last um, memorial uh, funeral held in the chapel, that'd be cool to know myself. I'd like to know. Um, da -da -da -da. Um, any tips for looking for Catholic burials in London cemeteries? Um, yes, that is something that I know there are different, there, there are many people who are passionate about um, find a grave and this kind of um, behavior of trying to actually look through different demographics. One thing I would say is that um, specifically in Abney, I know that um, the Abney on Earth project, which has been going on for, I think maybe three or four years now, has been um, to actually locate and map and digitize every single grave that's in Abney. And it would be a searchable database where you would be able to search for different, either, you know, um, time of burial, um, um, you know, faith demographics, that sort of. Um, so I'm not sure if other burial spaces have that level of searchable data, but um, I would say that, I, I don't know how you would say Catholic for all cemeteries, but each cemetery will have their own method of having a database. And if you go to them, I'm sure they'll be able to tell you who's to center, who's Catholic, who's Anglican. The, I'm, hopefully you'll be able to do that. But it would be, I would think, a cemetery by cemetery basis, not necessarily like, in, like a, a national archive, but I could be mistaken. Um, from Tom Albu, the graves in Abney now seem to be tightly packed. Was there originally more space between them? And is there an order to the way the graves are laid out? Yes, so there used to be quite wide avenues. It was more like a garden. So you would have trees, but in between them, you'd have low bushes, flowers. It was quite, you could see around you into the space. And the avenues were wide for walking. And then as it entered into, it was in 1890, they needed to create more space and get more revenue. So they infilled, so they, they brought, they narrowed the avenues down to make the winding paths that we are now quite familiar with. That was more burial space was created. Um, and then also with the tightly packing, what happened was when you have when you have burial sites, you can't exactly take a mower between them. You have to do hand clipping and that's quite um, labor and money intensive. So with the decline, as the 20th century progressed and you have the decline in revenue, having a gardener go out with his clippers to get around the graves 
that stopped. And where that happens, then you get the seedlings that crack up through graves. You have graves that topple because of root systems, and it, it creates this sort of topple effect after which you really can't clip it back. You, obviously, the days of mowing are long gone, as, as you can see. So a lot of that crooked sort of collapsing in on itself was not at all how it was originally designed, but basically the trees are winning, <laughs> sort of what's happening there. Um, let's see, um, Ellie, I might I, I, ugly, sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, did you come upon any um, forest, not garden cemeteries in the UK? Um, yes, I mean, I would say that that is a, that's very much a contemporary idea, this idea of forest burial. Um, I know that um, Epping Forest has a natural burial site that is a forest. Um, I do know that in um, in Arnos Vale, there is, they, they have a natural burial, it's kind of like a glade, so it's not necessarily, but it's within a forested area and there's, so I think that natural burial um, within a forest is definitely something that happens now. In the Victorian time, I don't think it would have been a natural forest, at least not anything mainstream, because the idea was the structured garden as opposed to a um, woodland, like a real, like wild type woodland, if that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, is that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so thank you so much, you guys, for joining us on our um, maiden voyage of doing this virtually. And I really look forward to seeing you in Abney when this madness is over. Thank you. Right, everyone. Uh, my name's Tom Walker. I was on at the start, also muted. Uh, but I'm the chair of the Trust. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to wrap up and say a few things. I mean, uh, Romney's talk is brilliant. So thank you, Romney, for doing this. We're all volunteers, but you've done by far and away the hard work tonight. And just seeing the comments, um, people, I think, really value this. So thank you very much to you. I think it's brilliant. We didn't know whether we'd get one person, let alone 140 online. And the fact that you're from around the corner, the fact that Amir, you and I have never met, but I follow your blog assiduously. Uh, Amir runs the brilliant Stokey History uh, blog that you're there answering all the difficult questions. That is a real privilege. And then we've got people from much further afield. I saw a couple of names saying from America, people in Bristol and all around the country. So thank you. I think it's amazing. Uh, it was a bit of an experiment, but I think it worked. Um, I don't want to be desperately needy but we are a charity <laughs> for money so if you want to contribute please do go to our main website we're a registered charity so we take our transparency and responsibility seriously we have some part-time staff we've got plans to do further monuments and we want to do more events like this so if you want to make a small donation or take out a direct debit we will be extremely grateful if you don't want to do that that's fine but please do contact us register for our newsletters i'm sure many of you have got talents and skills that we want to draw on we're looking for people who can help us with our comms and our marketing also our fundraising and there are always things to do uh, we maintain some of the graves so please come and get involved and then finally next week so next week as i said at the start the cemetery is 180 years old on may the 20th this was just the warm-up app there's a double header Next week, Alan, one of our local historians, doing an event uh, on the history, and then Sam talking about the suffragettes of Abney. So that's 7 p.m. next week. We've proved the technology can work. Uh, you all joined us. We're brilliant. Thank you very much. Please email us, tweet about us, follow us on Instagram, uh, buy whatever Romany is selling on our website. Uh, <laughs> we should build a network and look after this amazing place. So thank you very much. I'm going to sign off and say good night and thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye, everyone.